أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلي على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العلي العظيم Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's the greatest sale that you'll ever witness in your life and it's the biggest discount that's ever been offered by anyone but this sale only lasts for one night it begins at sunset at dusk and it finishes with sunrise, dawn. And there are a few differences between this sale that I'm speaking of and your everyday average sales that you see in newspapers, in magazines, on the internet, and you see on TV. Number one, your local mall isn't hosting the sale. Your local shopping center isn't hosting it. Macy's or, or JCPenney or none of these stores are hosting this sale. The host of this sale is none other than your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, the merchandise that's being sold in this sale is not clothes, nor jewelry, nor appliances, nor electronics, nor furniture. What's being sold in this sale is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and His mercy upon us and our freedom from the fires of hell. It's the greatest reward of Allah that's being offered, that's on display in this sale. And that's Al-Jannah, the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I said, it only lasts one night. Number three, the currency that you use in this sale to buy is not dollars or dinars or dirhams. It's none of the paper money that we human beings are accustomed to of this world. The currency that you use in this sale is your a'mal, salah, Quran, dua, and dhikr. The good deeds are your currency. That's how you buy Allah's forgiveness, Allah's mercy, Allah's satisfaction and grace. And that's how you're freed from the fires of hell, through your a'mal. If you haven't already figured it out, I'm speaking about Laylatul Qadr tonight. For some people, it may have, may have been tonight, last night. For others, tonight. Laylatul Qadr, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا Laylatul Qadr you can never comprehend the greatness of Laylatul Qadr. No, no matter how much I speak to you, brothers and sisters, about the greatness of Laylatul Qadr, it's not enough. You won't comprehend it. It's beyond our imagination. It's beyond our comprehension how great this night is. And we can talk all night about Laylatul Qadr and its greatness. But tonight, I'll speak about three important topics, three important questions that I will answer tonight. The first question, how many nights do we have that are Laylatul Qadr? Do we have three nights? Or do we have one night that's Laylatul Qadr? And if it's, three, if it's one night, when is it? When is Laylatul Qadr? That's number one. Number two, why is this night called Laylatul Qadr? The night of destiny. This is one of the interpretations of Al Qadr. Is that it is the night of destiny. Why is it called that? And number three, what is one of the most important a'mal that we're supposed to do during this night? And some of us, we forget to do this. So we begin with the first. Number one, how many nights of power do we have? 
Knights of Destiny do we have? Three or one? The ulama, they differ in this. There's two views. Some ulama say there's only one night of Qadr. Only one Laylatul Qadr. Others, they say there's no, there's three. So the first view that most ulama believe in is that there's only one night. So if there's only one night, why do we celebrate this night and three nights? The 19th of Ramadan, the 21st, and the 23rd night of Ramadan. Why? Well, the reason behind that, brothers and sisters, is because we have conflicting reports from the Imams and from the Holy Prophet about which night is Laylatul Qadr. We have traditions that say it's the 19th. We have traditions that say it's the 21st. And we have traditions that state it's the 23rd. So when I as a scholar, I come to read that hadith, I see there's a hadith for each night. So we're not sure which night is Laylatul Qadr because there are conflicting reports about that. But however, most ulama, they agree that most likely Laylatul Qadr is on a night like this, the 23rd night of Ramadan. And that's why if you see, they call it Laylatul Qadr al-Kubra, the big Laylatul Qadr. There's only one Laylatul Qadr. It's called the big one because most likely this is the real Laylatul Qadr. And I'll just read you two ahadith that the, that the ulama, they refer to in, in believing that the 23rd night is the true Laylatul Qadr. The first hadith is called Hadithul Juhani. It's a very famous hadith. And basically what it is is that there was a man by the name of Juhani. And he comes to Rasulullah one year during Ramadan. And he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, my house is very far from your masjid. And when I come, I have to bring my, my animals with me, my sheep, my uh, goats, my camels and horses, whatever I have. And I have to bring all my family with me. And it's a huge family. And I can't come every night during Ramadan because my house is far. So he tells Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, choose one night which is the most important night out of Ramadan and it's the greatest night out of Ramadan and I'll come only that night. <clears throat> the narrators, the companions of Rasulullah, they say, we saw Rasulullah, he called Al-Juhani and he whispered something in his ear. We never heard. And nobody asked Rasulullah what you said, what he said. So they said Al-Juhani left. When did he come back? He came back on the 23rd night of Ramadan and he brought his entire family telling them that this is the greatest night of Ramadan. And they said every year until he died, he would only come during the 23rd night of Ramadan. So the ulama, they understand from this hadith that the man asked Rasulullah, what's the most important night that I should come? Rasulullah told him something that he came the 23rd. So obviously Rasulullah told him, come the 23rd night of Ramadan. And that night obviously should be Laylatul Qadr because Laylatul Qadr is the most important night in Ramadan. So Rasulullah told him obviously come during the 23rd night because it is Laylatul Qadr. Rasulullah didn't tell the Ashab, the companions, this is Laylatul Qadr. But all we understood is that this is the most important night. And we know for a fact that Laylatul Qadr is the best night in Ramadan. So that's why the 23rd night of Ramadan is Laylatul Qadr according to this authentic hadith. This is one hadith. And then there's another hadith that Imam Ali alayhi salam, he narrates. He says, during the time of Rasulullah, one night, Rasulullah, he sees a dream. He sees a dream that it's Laylatul Qadr and it's raining. And as we know, the dreams of the prophets of Allah, the messengers of Allah are all true dreams. They're all revelation. If I see something in my dream, most likely it's nonsense. Some people, every dream they see, they want an interpretation. That's not how it is, brothers and sisters. Yes, a minority of my dreams are called, according to the ahadith, al-ru'ya sadiqa. They're the true dreams that, that actually have a meaning. But 95% of our dreams are nonsense. It's just something that my mind is showing me. It doesn't have a meaning. But the dreams of the prophets are all true dreams. That means it always has a true meaning. So the Ashab, they said, after we heard the hadith, the dream of Rasulullah, it didn't rain until it was the 23rd night of Ramadan. The dream of Rasulullah came true. He said, I saw it's Laylatul Qadr. He didn't say which night is Laylatul Qadr. He just said it's, it's Laylatul Qadr and it's raining. When did it rain that year in Ramadan? It rained during the 23rd night of Ramadan. 
And one of the narrators, he says, we saw mud on the nose of Rasulullah. So some ulama, they say the 23rd night of Ramadan is Laylatul Qadr because of this tradition. So as I said, it's a matter of reading the ahadith and understanding which night is the true night of destiny. And you might wonder, why is there the disagreement in the ahadith? Why didn't the companions, why didn't the... The, the companions of the Holy Prophet and the Imams ask, just go and ask the Prophet, when is Laylatul Qadr? The reason is, many times they would ask, Rasulullah and the Imams would not tell them. We have many traditions, they used to ask Imam al-Sadiq, when is Laylatul Qadr? Is it 19, 21 or 23? The Imam, he tells them, doesn't matter. Do the a'mal of Laylatul Qadr all three nights. In one hadith he says, ma aysar laylatayn. So what? Who cares when the true Laylatul Qadr is? The point is, do the a'mal of Laylatul Qadr during all these three nights. Because if it wasn't Laylatul Qadr, if tonight wasn't Laylatul Qadr, and I did the 100 rak'ahs, and I did dua, and I read dua Josh, and I read Quran, did I waste my time? If on the day of judgment I find out 23 was a Laylatul Qadr? No, because you did good deeds anyway. It's good to read Quran throughout the year, not just Laylatul Qadr. So it's as if Allah hid Laylatul Qadr. Why? So that we could do the a'mal of Laylatul Qadr in all three nights and receive the reward three times. It's the, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he hid Laylatul Qadr. Or else we'd only do the a'mal once. If it was 21, we'd just do it 21. Nobody would do anything. We'd go and sleep the 23rd and 19th. But now since it's a mystery between three nights, we do the a'mal all three nights and we receive three times as much as the reward. And that's why in one tradition, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he's narrated that one day his companions, they asked him, Ya Amir al muminin tell us, when is Laylatul Qadr? Look at the answer of the Imam. The Imam's a teacher. He wants to discipline us. He wants to show us how to live this life and what perspective and what mentality and ideology to live by. The Imam, he says, Ma akhlu min an akuna a'lamaha fa'astura ilmaha. He says, look, I know when Laylatul Qadr is, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. And then he says, وَلَسْتُ أَشُكْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ إِنَّمَا يَسْتُرْهَا عَنْكُمْ نَظَرًا لَكُمْ لِأَنَّهُ لَوْ أَعْلَمَكُمُوهَا عَمِلْتُمْ فِيهَا وَتَرَكْتُمْ غَيْرَهَا He says, and Allah likewise, He doesn't want you to know when the real Laylatul Qadr is. That's why the Holy Prophet, He whispered in the ears of Al-Juhani. Al-Juhani could only come once. So Rasulullah said, let me tell him the real night. But for the Muslims who live right by the masjid, Allah doesn't want them to know when Laylatul Qadr is. Why? Because the Imam, He says, if Allah tells you this night is Laylatul Qadr, you're not going to do any good deeds on the rest of the night. So it's a mystery to us. It's like a pop quiz. Why do we have pop, quiz, pop quizzes? Can't the teacher tell me tomorrow's a test? Because he wants me to be ready every day. Don't just study for the test. Study so you know the material. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to live by. Treat every night like Laylatul Qadr. And in fact, brothers and sisters, if I can grab your attention, I know it's very crowded and it's very loud, but if I can just please grab your attention so we understand the importance of Laylatul Qadr. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And that's why our tradition states that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the last 10 days of Ramadan, he would go and he would move into the masjid. He would live in the masjid. Why? So that he could do ibadah, worship 24-7. The whole 10 days, it was Laylatul Qadr. For us, for some of us, we only have one night during the year, the 23rd that we come to the masjid, or three nights, 19, 21, 23, and we spend it in ibadah, worship till Fajr. For Rasulullah, every year of his life, the last 10 days of Ramadan, every night was Laylatul Qadr for him. He used to spend the entire last 10 days living in the masjid. He would live there 24 hours a day. He wouldn't leave the masjid. In constant state of ibadah. So it's besides the point when Laylatul Qadr is. Treat every night like Laylatul Qadr. And that's why Allah hid this night, Laylatul Qadr, amongst three nights. So that we could do more good deeds. Remember, I said this many times. Allah, He wants to create any excuse for us so that He gives us a reward. So Allah says, yes, there's only one, but I'm going to hide it between three so that you do it all three times. And you receive the reward three times. 
So this is the first view. Remember we said the first view holds that there is only one night of power, but we don't know which one it is, and most likely it is the 23rd night of Ramadan. But then there's a, ne a second view that some ulama they believe in. They say no, there isn't just one night of, one night of destiny, one Laylatul Qadr, there's three. 19, 21, and 23 are all Laylatul Qadr. There's three nights together they make up Laylatul Qadr. But however, each one of these nights, it has a different role. Each one comes in a different stage. There's three stages of Laylatul Qadr. How? And that these ulama, they say, that I'm going to mention in the second question, the second topic that I addressed, that Laylatul Qadr is a night that Allah decides everything until next year. I'll speak about this in a minute. So the, these ulama, they say, that this decision making process of Allah is in three stages. The first stage happens during the 19th night of Ramadan. And what does Allah do during this night? They call it at taqdeer He sets the budget. So during a night like 19th Ramadan, Allah basically says that during this, during this year, from this Laylatul Qadr till Laylatul Qadr of next year, I will pass out this much mercy. So the budget is set during 19th. During the 21st of Ramadan, this is what's called Al-Qadha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides, divides the budget. 10, 10 for this person, 20 for Muhammad, 15 for Ali, for Fatima, for Zainab. Allah distributes the budget between the human beings. And then the 23rd night of Ramadan is what's the night of Ibram. This is the night that Allah verifies, approves everything and it's a done deal. So Laylatul Qadr is not just one night according to the second view. It's three nights in three stages. So this is the first question. Now we understand there's two views. Most ulama believe it's only one night and most likely it's the 23rd night. The second question that we raised. Why is this night called the night of destiny? Now we should already know the answer that I just mentioned. It's called the night of destiny. Qadr in the Arabic language, Al-Qadr wa taqdir means when something is destined, when, when something is decided. So it's called Laylatul Qadr because everything is decided tonight on Laylatul Qadr. From now till one year, ne till next Laylatul Qadr, Allah decides everything according to the Quran. And according to the Hadith, everything is decided in the Quran. Where does Allah say that in the Quran? He says, Fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim. Allah speaks about the night that the Quran was revealed in Surah al dukhan and He says that it was revealed during Laylatul Qadr, and He says during that night, everything is decided. What do I mean everything? Listen to the hadith of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says about this verse, فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ He says, يُقَدَّرُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ يَكُونُ فِي تِلْكَ السَّنَةِ إِلَى مِثْلِهَا مِنْ قَابِلٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides everything during Laylatul Qadr. Like what? He gives examples. He says, مِنْ خَيْرٍ أَوْ شَرٍ أَوْ طَاعَةٍ أَوْ مَعْصِيَةٍ أَوْ مَوْلُودٍ أَوْ أَجَلٍ أَوْ رِزْقٍ Any good deeds that I will do, it's all destined tonight. From now till next year. Any bad deeds that I shall do this year, it's all decided tonight. If I will receive sustenance, if I will receive that job, if I will live a comfortable life this year or not, it's all decided this year. If I will have a child or not, it's decided this year. If I will die or not, it's decided tonight. Everything is decided on Laylatul Qadr. And in fact, we have some traditions, brothers and sisters, that state that amongst the things that are decided tonight are unchangeable things. That when Allah decides and He says this is going to happen, some of those things are unchangeable. I'll speak about this next week. We have a type of qadha, a destiny which is unchangeable. It's called al qadha al-mahtoom. When Allah writes it, it's not going to change. Even dua is not going to change it. Now maybe most things aren't like this. Dua can change. I'll speak about this next week. But if there is something that won't change, the unchangeable 
things that Allah decides, it's going to happen tonight. So if I was supposed to die this year, when the Laylatul Qadr is about to finish and Allah writes, Fulan is supposed to die. Fulan is supposed to have a terrible year. If I don't do anything to change that, it's not going to change. Now, many things, they do change, like I said. But there are some things that don't change. The ajal, that is mahtoom. The qadha, that is mahtoom. That's unchangeable. So we have to be very careful. But why is it decided tonight, you might ask? So Allah, just, just like that, He decides that I'm going to have a terrible year, that I'm going to sin, that I'm going to be a mu'min? No. Allah doesn't decide just like that for no reason. Allah, He sees how you perform on this night. If you spend this night in ibadah, worship, if you spend it in dua, and you ask Allah to give you a good year, and you do good deeds during Laylatul Qadr, Allah writes a good year for you. He says, this person, look, he spent entire Laylatul Qadr in ibadah, worship, I will write for him everything that is good. But if I spend it sleeping, if I spend it wasting time and chatting, and doing other things besides ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't write me good things during that year. So it's in my hands, brothers and sisters. This is not predestination that God decides and that's it, I can't change. It's all in our hands under our control. So spend Laylatul Qadr wisely, brothers and sisters. And from this, we understand because Laylatul Qadr is the night of destiny and everything is decided from now till next year, we have to be very careful how we spend tonight or whenever Laylatul Qadr is, whether it was last night, the 19th, 21st. Why? Because from now till next year, your fate and whatever happens to you is in your hands right now. Spend this night wisely. Ask Allah to give you a good year. And that's why we understand the answer to the third question that we posed. What's one of the most important things that we should do tonight, brothers and sisters? Is dua. That's what I'm speaking about this whole month. Dua. Spend a few minutes and speak with Allah and ask Him to give you good things. Ramadan is the month of dua, brothers and sisters. We said that there are conditions to dua. If you don't meet those conditions, you're not going to find the answer. But what's beautiful about Ramadan, the Holy Prophet, he says about Ramadan in his sermon that he spoke about Ramadan, he said, Wa dua'ukum fihi mustajab. Allah will answer your dua during Ramadan. That means Allah will be more lenient in giving you what you want. So that means if I didn't meet some conditions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me what I want anyway. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes ex exceptions that He tells you, yes, there are 10 conditions, for example, to dua. But in Ramadan, I'll make them five. In Ramadan, I'll make them three. I know you didn't meet some of the conditions of dua, but yet because it's Ramadan, because, I, because I'm so kind in Ramadan, I'm going to give it to you anyway. So that's why I take advantage of this month and read dua every night. Dua Abu Hamza, dua Iftitah, and any other duas that you wish. And the most important night in Ramadan is this night, Laylatul Qadr. It's the night of dua. Everything is decided this night. So ask wisely. Ask Allah to give you everything that you want. The hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose out of the week, the best day is one, Jum'ah, Friday. And he chose out of the year, the best month is Ramadan. And out of the night, the best night is Laylatul Qadr. It's mentioned in the Quran. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. It's better than 1,000, not nights, 1,000 months. So it's better than 30,000 nights. One night, it's equal to 30,000 nights. If you do a worship during this night, Laylatul Qadr, Allah will times it by 30,000. Isn't this unbelievable? Don't waste a second of it, brothers and sisters. It's only, and especially now in the summer, where it's so short, it begins at 9 and it finishes at 4.30. So you only have a couple of hours. Take advantage of it and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you everything. And when I, when I say ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you everything, I mean it, brothers and sisters. Ask Allah to give you everything. Have high ambitions. There is a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that says on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring two people to give them the reward. 
And these two people, they lived the exact same lives. They had the same belief, the same iman. They, had, they did the same amount of good deeds. So obviously their reward should be equal, right? So Allah, He gives one of them the reward. And then He gives the other one a greater reward. So the first one, He objects. He says, Ya Allah, that's not fair. This guy was exactly like me. We all prayed at the same time. We went to hajj together. We did the same amount of good deeds. Why are you giving him a greater reward? Look at the answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells him, you know why I gave him more than you? Because he asked for more. And you never asked. He used to always ask, Oh Allah, give me more than I deserve. Oh Allah, give me more. He had high ambitions. You never asked for more. You never asked for it. He asked for it, I gave him. You never asked for that extra. And that's why I didn't give you. So tonight, ask for everything with Allah. And number one, two points when we ask. Number one, like I said, have high ambitions. Have high aspirations. Ask for the biggest things, the greatest things. There's a tradition that says that an angel, one day he was crossing. He was, you know, just flying over the, the world one day. Until he came across an island. This is during the time of Bani Israel, thousands of years ago. So he sees a worshiper. There's a guy, he's a abid. All he does worship Allah from day and night. He sees he's worshiping Allah all by himself in this island and it's filled with trees and grass. So this angel asks God, he tells him, Oh Allah, show me the reward of this abid. Allah shows him, he sees it's a very it's a very small reward. He, should, he expected more because he's a abid, he's a prostrator. All he does is worship Allah. So he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why? Why are you giving him such a small amount of reward? Allah tells him, go and live with him with one day and you'll see why. So he goes and he lives. You know, he just basically looks at that guy and, and uh, wants to spend a day with him. So he goes, he says, I'm an angel of Allah and I want to spend one day with you. He says, okay. So he says, you're a abid. He says, yes, I worship Allah. He says, is there anything you want from Allah? He says, no. You have no needs from Allah? He says, no. And then he says, you know what? There's just one thing that's in my heart. This is my biggest wish in my life. If Allah does this, I'll be the happiest man in the world. He says, what is it? The angel says, what is it? He says, look at this island. It's filled with grass. He says, I wish God had a donkey that he could come and eat this grass. God doesn't have a donkey that eats the grass. All this grass is being wasted. This is my biggest wish in my life. The angel, he says, okay, now I understand why your reward is so little. Because he has such small ambitions. His greatest wish in his life is that Allah brings down a donkey and he starts eating the grass so the grass doesn't get wasted. Let's not be like that person, brothers and sisters. There are lessons that we learn from, from the history of how to ask when we ask. There's a famous story that a man comes to Rasulullah one day. And this man, when Rasulullah went to Ta'if, a city of Ta'if, before he became a messenger, before he was sent, he went, he didn't have anywhere to stay. Some guy in that city, he told him, come to my house. He gave him shelter, he gave him food. He was very kind with him. So when Rasulullah became a king and he became the ruler and a prophet and everything, this guy heard. Rasulullah, the man that I gave him shelter and everything, he was my guest, now he's a prophet. He goes to him. And he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, do you know me? He says, no, who are you? He says, I'm the man that 20, 30 years ago you came to my house and I was so kind with you. He says, yes, I remember you. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to repay me. I was so kind with you when you needed me. Now you're so strong, so be kind with me. Rasulullah says, ask anything and I'll give you. He could have asked for anything, brothers and sisters. Do you know what he asked for? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I want 200 sheep. 200 sheep. And that's all I want. So Rasulullah, he prays for Allah. Allah sends him the 200 sheep. When he leaves, Rasulullah tells his companions. He tells them, can you believe this guy? I'm the messenger of Allah. I ask him, ask for anything. He could have asked for Jannah. He could have asked to be with me in my level in Jannah. He could have asked for everything. He asked for 200 sheep. And then Rasulullah says, Ala sa'ala mithl... He says only if he was as smart as the old lady of Bani Israel. So the companions, they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, what's the story of the old lady of Bani Israel? 
The Holy Prophet tells his companions that Musa one day Allah tells him when he was moving from Egypt to Palestine to Sham, wherever he was going, he told him that when you go, you have to take with you the bones or the body of Yusuf, the prophet who was before him. So Musa doesn't know where his body is. So he asks his friends and companions, who knows where Yusuf is buried? They tell him there's only one old lady that knows where Yusuf is buried. So they call that old lady, she comes. What is it you want, Musa? He tells her, I want you to tell me where the grave of Yusuf is. So she tells him, I'll tell you under one condition. He says, what? Under one condition, I make a request and you ask God for that thing. If you accept, I'll tell you where she is. So he says, okay, fine. She tells him, I'll tell you where the grave of Yusuf is. And you give me three things. Number one, I'm an old lady. I want to be young again. Number two, I'm blind. I want my sight back. This is a prophet. He could do miracles. And number three, when I go to Jannah, I don't want, I don't want to just go to Jannah. I want to be your neighbor in Jannah. Look at the high ambitions. She wants the highest levels of Jannah. Under these three conditions, I'll give you. Musa, he was kind of disappointed. He was kind of angered how rude she is. He wanted to reject her. Allah told him, no, don't reject her. I'm giving her this. I'm, I'm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kind. I'll give her. So Musa, he says, fine. And he gives her all these three things. And then she says, the grave of Yusuf is in this place. So Rasulullah tells his companions, why didn't he ask just like the old lady of Bani Israel? Have high ambitions. When you sit with Allah, don't say, Oh Allah, I want you to send me $300. What's $300? You can ask that. But that's, the, that's not the only thing you ask for, a car or a spouse. Ask for the biggest things. Ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees you from the fires of hell. Ask for the mercy of Allah. Ask for Allah's forgiveness. Ask Him for al-jannah. Ask Him to give you good, believing, pious children that you raise in this country. It's difficult to keep them practicing good Muslims. Ask Allah that He gives you the ability that you have good believing sons and daughters. And then ask Him for everything else that you want in this world. So have high ambitions, brothers and sisters, when you ask. That's number one. And number two, when you do, when you do dua, brothers and sisters, the best type of dua to do is to ask your brothers and sisters to pray for you. You see, because I'll speak about this the day after tomorrow. That we human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I become selfish, He doesn't like that. When I just ask too much for myself, unless I'm a very pious man. So the best way to do dua is tell your brothers and sisters and your friends to do dua for you because that's so unselfish. Instead of doing dua for myself, let me do dua for my brothers and sisters and family and, and friends. And according to the hadith, let me read you the hadith, that if you do dua in this way, this is the fastest, the fastest dua that Allah answers. Listen to this hadith. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, Asra'u dua najahan lil ijaba The fastest dua, that as soon as you ask, Allah gives it to you. What is it? He says, dua al-akhih, dua al-akh li-akhih bi-dahr al-ghayb. When you do a dua for your brothers and sisters, for other people, Allah right away He gives it to you because you're not selfish. And then the hadith says, I'll give you what you want to your friend. And not only will I give your friend, I'll give you twice as much as you're asking for your friend because you're so unselfish. Because you're think thinking about other people, not just about yourselves. So tonight, brothers and sisters, make a deal an agreement with everyone else, with all your friends and family members. Tell them tonight, instead of I pray for myself and you pray for yourself, I'll pray for you and you get what you want and you pray for me and I get what I want. Be smart when you do dua. There are ways. Remember we said there's conditions, there's rules, there's guidelines. This is the best type of dua. Allah will answer it right away. And in fact, as I said, uh, I'll speak about this in a few days that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He doesn't answer our dua because we've done sins some sins they prevent our dua from going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah He says you've committed these sins I'm not going to answer your dua so in one beautiful hadith Allah He tells Musa 
the best solution to ask Allah if you're a sinner? He says, Ya Musa, ud'uni bilisan lam ta'asihi. If you want me to answer you, listen, it's a very beautiful dua. He says, if you want me to answer you, do dua on a tongue that you have never disobeyed me on. So Musa, he says, now Musa is infallible, but for us, for me, I could never do that because I've sinned in my life. So how can I ask God with a tongue that's infallible? It's impossible. So Musa tells Allah, how do I do that? I'm a sinner, I can't do that. Well, Musa is speaking on our behalf. He's not a sinner. Allah tells him, Ud'uni ala lisani ghayrik. Let your family members and friends do dua for you. I sin on, with my tongue, but do I sin with my brother's tongue? No. So my brother's tongue, I've never sinned with it. Let him do dua for me. And it's as if I have prayed to Allah with a tongue that has never disobeyed him. You see how clever that is? So make an agreement with your friends and family members. They do dua for you and you do dua for them. And you'll receive reward as well. Remember I said the angel says, I'll give you twice as much. I ask Allah, oh Allah, give my brother, my father, my cousin, my son, whoever, this much amount of reward. The angel says, I'll give him that and I'll give you twice as much as I'll give, the, uh, as I'll give him. And then finally, brothers and sisters, let me read you this hadith and inshallah we'll end with this. That if you do du'a for your brothers and sisters, if you constantly teach yourself to pray for your, everyone else, not only will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that du'a, not only will He give you twice as much, but listen, that those people that you do du'a for on the day of judgment, they can do shafa'a for you. You know shafa'a? You intercede on behalf of someone else. Someone else who hasn't, doesn't have too much good deed, I ask Allah, I intercede, I tell him, Oh Allah, please forgive him for my sake. Allah will forgive him. We know the Imams and the Holy Prophet, they have shafa'a. They intercede on our behalf and they help us when we're our need on the Day of Judgment. Even your family members and friends, if they're mu'min, they can help you. Listen to this hadith of Rasulullah. The Holy Prophet says, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ الْمُؤْمِنْ لَيُؤْمَرْ بِهِ إِلَى النَّارِ يَكُونُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَعْصِيَ وَالْخَطَايَا On the Day of Judgment, some of us, may God forbid, Allah says, you didn't do anything, you were such a sinner. He tells the angels, take him to hell. So while they're dragging me to the fires of hell, some good friends of mine and family members who are better than me, they see me. They see that I'm being dragged to the fires of hell. What do they say? فَيَقُولُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ إِلَاهَنَا عَبْدُكَ هَذَا كَانَ يَدْعُو لَنَا فَشَفِّعْنَا فِيهِ it's a beautiful dua. So they see that this friend of theirs or this family member of theirs is being dragged to the fires of hell. So right away, what do they do? They tell him, Oh Allah, this person that you're dragging to the hell, he did dua for me. He, I benefited from him. So it's not fair that he goes to hell. No, I can't watch this. So they beg Allah. They ask Allah to save him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves that sinner, not for his sake, but for the sake of his family members and friends that he did dua for. So if I do dua for other people, I'm going to benefit from that on the day of judgment. Not only will Allah give me twice as much in this dunya, they will become my shufa'a on the day of judgment. And finally, brothers and sisters, once when you begin to do dua and ask Allah, and you begin to pray for others, always begin with others. There's a, certain, there's a certain etiquette that I have to go by. Anytime you want to do dua for others, who do you begin with? Who do you begin with? You begin with your imam, brothers and sisters. Imam al-Mahdi Allahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Do dua for him. When I go to visit any shrine, anytime I want to do dua, I always begin with Imam al-Mahdi. Even though I said this last night, he doesn't need our dua, we need him. When I do dua for him, I show him that I care for him, that I'm thinking about him. And remember, we said, you, we said when you do a dua for others, we benefit. We get twice as much and they help us on the day of judgment. So begin with the 12th Imam. And the best thing is say, Allahumma ajjil waleek al-faraj. Oh Allah, hasten his reappearance. 
and consider me amongst the followers and the warriors of Imam Al Mahdi. This is number one. You begin with Imam Al Mahdi. Number two, who do you pray after that for? You pray for your father and your mother, your parents. And then your grandparents, your children, your brothers, your sisters, your uncles and aunts and nephews and niece, the farther. So you start with the closest people to you, your parents, and you go, and then your second cousin, third cousins, and your family members, and then you do dua for your friends and your teachers and whoever you love. So anytime you do dua, brothers and sisters, you begin with Imam al-Mahdi, you end with your friends, and do dua for all the Muslims and all the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Listen to this hadith. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Man qala Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat katab Allahu lahu bi kulli mu'min khalaqahu Allah mundhu khalaq Allah Adam ila an taquma as-sa'a hasana if you say this dua, it takes you three seconds to say it. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive the mu'mins, the male ones and the female ones. Al mu'minin wal mu'minat. Do you know how much reward Allah will give you? The Holy Prophet says, how many people have lived since Adam till the Day of Judgment? Probably 100 billion people. Allah will give you for each human being that He created, or for each mu'min that he created, millions upon millions of mu'mins from the time of Adam till the time, till the day of judgment, for each mu'min, Allah will give you a hasana. So if there is a hundred million mu'mins that Allah created throughout time, he'll give you a hundred million hasanat just for saying, Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. And he will erase from your book of bad deeds as much as there are good believers. And he will... And he will give you a reward and he will escalate your position in the Jannah. How many degrees? As much mu'mins as Allah created throughout time. It's so simple. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. So always do dua for others, brothers and sisters. You begin with Imam al Mahdi, then your family members, and then all the Muslims, and then be ask Allah for yours, for your hajat, for your wishes. And when you ask for your hajat, Begin with the hajat of the akhirah first. Don't begin with the worldly materialistic hajat. So say, Allah, give me iman. Give me taqwa. Give me piety. I want to go to hajj. If anyone wants to go to hajj, brothers and sisters, this year, it's decided tonight. Do dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes you amongst the hujjaj. Even if you don't have money, even if you can't go, do dua. Tell Allah to to help you go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send you. Allah he can send you the money. Allah can send you the paper, the passport, whatever that you need. So do dua. Ask Allah that I want to go to hajj this year. That I want to become a mu'min this year. That yes, tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe for this past couple of years I've sinned so much but tonight, Laylatul Qadr, this is when everything changes. This is when everything is decided. I want you to write me a good year. And I begin by repenting. Shed a tear with Allah. Tell him, oh Allah, I've been such a bad slave, servant for you. And forgive me, I want to start in a new chapter. And Allah will forgive you. Wallahi, He will forgive you. We mention in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He says in the Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Allah says to all those people that have done so much haram, unbelievable amount of haram. They've done every sin in the book. Don't lose hope. Allah forgives all your sins, but you have to ask for His forgiveness. Ask. Tonight is the best night to repent. If I didn't pray for my entire life, start tonight, brothers and sisters. This is the greatest night out of the year. Start tonight. Allah will forgive you. Make up your salah and start praying. If I'm a sister and I don't wear hijab for my entire life, repent tonight. Tell Him, Allah, forgive me. I'm sorry for not doing it. But tonight is the night and Allah will help you. He'll push you. You'll see it's much easier if you make the commitment tonight. Remember, everything is decided tonight. But you have to make the commitment. You have to ask Allah to give you the power, the tawfiq to do it. And like I said, ask Allah to send you to hajj if you haven't went to hajj. And I said this yesterday, the YMA, they have a beautiful hajj group. And you could ask from the YMA administrators about it. All the 
the a'mal and all the lectures are conducted in English. And like I said yesterday, hajj is difficult, brothers and sisters. It's complicated. If you go without correct guidance, you're probably going to mess up your hajj. And if for the ones, for us, that we don't speak Arabic too well, there's limited amount, there's limited groups that we, have to go, that we can go with. The YMA conducts all its programs in English under the guidance and leadership of Imam Sayyid Hassan al-Ghazwini. Ask anyone that went with the YMA and they'll tell you what a beautiful group it is. You'll enjoy it. You'll get, you'll, uh, you'll get the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the informative lectures of this Hajj group. So if you, if you haven't enrolled, enroll tonight. If you can't go, you don't have the money, you don't have the time, tonight ask Allah to give you the time. Ask Allah to give you the money. It's all in the hands of Allah. I spoke about this. He's the true source. He's the one that controls my life in this world. It's not my boss. It's not my job. These are all means, brothers and sisters. Put your hope into Allah. Ask Him tonight, Laylatul Qadr, and have a high aspirations. So make that commitment with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will insha'Allah change your life. And in the end, I make a kind request to all my brothers and sisters to also include me in your dua as I need your dua. And insha'Allah, I shall pray for every single one of you. Only a few hours remain from this beautiful night. Take advantage of it, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, we will regret it. Allah is giving us the best, the best opportunity. One night that equals 30,000 nights. Don't waste a second. If you're sitting, have nothing to do, then least think, read Surah Inna Anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. It's mustahab to read this Surah on Laylatul Qadr 1,000 times. If you can't read it 1,500, if you can't 100, if you can't 50, 10, as much as you can. Don't waste a second. The easiest thing, just read Inna Anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr as much as you can until dawn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, insha'Allah, He shall be kind with us. Wa akhiru da'wana in alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين